got from her a, a crucifix and the use of a private jet. Um, sorry, he gave her the private jet, she gave him the crucifix and many, many indulgences and pieces of support. Maxwell used her for a fundraising pyramid scheme to back um, one of his newspapers while he was raiding its pension fund. So that I just think the picture's so hilarious of her sitting there with her rosary while he's on the phone apparently drumming up custom. Here's what the cover of the book looks like. Um, how much does this cost, by the way? There you have me. Um, you don't I, know? I ought, I ought to know and I don't. It doesn't say. And it doesn't say. Jones Island, South Carolina. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jones Island. You're on the air. There you go. Hello. Oh, hello. Good morning, Brian. How you doing? Um, just fine, sir. Um, good morning, gentlemen. And my question is to Christopher Higgins. And I am, Hitchens, I'm sorry, I always get so nervous. I'm so glad you're back to the subject of the book. Um, concerning Mother Teresa, I heard a brief report last week <coughs> that she had entered into prayer for AIDS children, babies that are born dying of AIDS. Um, you know, she wants a cure. And then there is this lady, I believe she's in New York, and I think her name is, they call her Mother Jones. She takes a lot of these abandoned <coughs> babies from the hospital, and under um, <coughs> the funds, I suppose, I'm not too sure, she um, takes care of them. Um, what I would like to know is what is your opinion as a society? <coughs> How should, what, what obligations would we have, should we have, on taking care of babies that are born dying? And I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Well, um... I can't believe that this woman, by the way, is able to take dying or AIDS-suffering uh, babies from a hospital in order to look after them. But it's, I suppose it's possible. If the story went, went past my bat. Um, I think that uh, we're in a very grave moment just now. Um, that's partly why I wanted to bring up the arrest of those clergymen at the Rotunda yesterday, um, where it seems that the, that, uh, the society at least as expressed by, by Congress and through the wish of the President, is, is going to say that it doesn't want any longer to shoulder the burden of responsibility for all American children. I'd like to ask... They're going to cut them off the bottom of the roll. The, the two of you, uh, what, what do you think of... Uh, I've talked to Christopher Hitchens for years about... There's the price. Yes, yeah, it's twelve ninety five. And a snip at the price. Um, what do you think of him being... I don't know if the word is obsessed, but you certainly have written and talked a lot about Mother Teresa over the last couple of years? Well, I don't think it's obsession. Thank you. You have a... No, look, I mean, you, 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 you have a subject and you're, uh, you're taking it on, and I haven't read the book yet, so I'm not going to comment. I suspect, <laughs> I suspect it's a little harsher than I would be, at least. But uh, I wouldn't... If you'd been doing this for 40 years, then, I might, then we might be getting into obsession. But uh, a couple up, years... Steve. It keeps on coming up. This, um, this week... Um, the, the nastiest thing that Michael Mandelbaum and his co-authors in the Critique of Clinton's Foreign Policy can find to say about it is that um, it's the foreign policy of Mother Teresa. In other words, they, by which they, they mean, or think they mean, that it's, it's naive to the point of being too charitable. Of course, what I argue about Mother Teresa is that she's the reverse of that. In the reports of the uh, vote on um, divorce in Ireland uh, recently, for example, where Ireland was until last week the only country in Europe where divorce was illegal. Finally, in a referendum, the Irish people voted against the advice of the church um, and voted to legalize divorce. Mother Teresa intervened very heavily on the other side, um, which is the sort of thing she tends to do. She's always involving herself in political disputes in other countries. She's basically a, a political rather than charitable figure. The reports that mentioned this mentioned it in a bewildered way as if even Mother Teresa got involved rather than as if that's just what you'd expect her to do. And so as long as that impression is so widespread, I suppose I have to keep on trying to correct it. Uh, speaking of, of bedfellows and connections mm -hmm. and all this stuff, uh, this is a, just a little piece in the National Journal, and, and I want to ask you to explain what this means. There's an a, a art piece here with uh, it's President Lincoln there with a, you know, with a camera, and there's no face on it, but it says, okay, what's Jude really up to? And, and this is in the National Journal at the bottom of the page. It came out today. It says, in an odd Bedfellows Alliance, conservative political activist and economic consultant Jude Winiski is backing the candidacy of De Democratic Representative Robert G. Torricelli for a New Jersey Senate seat. <coughs> Winiski, and the reason I ask this is you say you're writing for Forbes FYI, and <coughs> Jude Winiski's been involved with Steve Forbes and uh, his presidential candidacy. Winiski, 
who recently hosted a dinner at a Midtown Manhattan restaurant at which his wealthy Wall Street clients met the candidate, said he told Torricelli, quote, if there weren't an active, lively Democratic Party, the Republican Party would continue right until it ran into Adolf Hitler, unquote. A, a, a shift toward Hitler, Winiski elaborated, would be toward a government that's, quote, no compassion, ellipses, all individualism. What's Jude Waniski up to? Can no compassion us? is certainly a, a mild description of a government that's like Adolf Hitler. Uh, look, I read The Way the World Works when it came out. His book. His book in uh, the late 70s. I thought it was very important. I'll always acknowledge my debt to it. But Jude Waniski told me during the last election cycle that Ross Perot was going to win an overwhelming majority in the Electoral College unless the leaders of the world, world finance had him assassinated. I'll say no more. Las Vegas, thanks for waiting again. I'm sorry to keep you folks on the line. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I'm reading the Las Vegas Review uh, Journal and the Sun. Wait, I have it right here. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I thought I did. Sorry. Okay. I, I must have left it uh, in, in the restroom. Oh, for heaven's sake. Uh, I'm, two things. Is uh, Bosnian aid... $600 million to re re rebuild the country, and uh, that will run into billions of dollars. And then I go down and I see I'm an ex-Californian. I moved out of there six years ago because you couldn't even move in the traffic. But uh, they have an Im immigrant influx there, and they've got three and a half million legal immigrants and two and a half million illegal. Now they're all applying for citizenship so they can vote. And they say that if they had voted then, that 187, the proposition wouldn't have passed. Well, here I am living in Nevada, and I have to pay taxes for those people. Even though I don't vote in California, I don't live there, and I vote from Nevada, I'm still paying for these illegal immigrants. You're also less living in the fastest growing city in America. Do you know that? Oh, yes. Uh, the traffic is getting just as tremendous as it was in California when I left. What's uh, either one of your reaction to our caller's initial comment about immigrants? Well, look, uh, uh, America, I, I don't think you can dogmatize on this to, uh, to have a position that applies in all cases. And in fact, American immigration policy uh, or American immigration has varied over the last 200 years. We've had periods when very few immigrants were coming in, and then we've had periods when a lot have come in. It's gone in cycles. It hasn't been a steady thing. Now, up until this century, these cycles were controlled by uh, events in Europe, mostly, uh, wars, famines. Uh, you had a famine, you got people. You had wars, often that prevented people from coming. They were controlled by external events. But as we've gotten into the 20th century, a travel to America has become easy enough and cheap enough so that we no longer have this uh, external regulator on it. And if we want to maintain the policy, policy that we've had over two centuries, and which has worked, that is to say uh, uh, cyclical, you have ingestion and then you have digestion. If we want that, we have to do that ourselves. Uh, by our own laws, and I think it's time for a period of digestion. Richard Brookheiser, are you still writing a column for the Observer? Yes, I am. Are you still writing for Time Magazine? Uh, occasionally. Are you still writing for the Talk of the Town in the New Yorker? Uh, probably not since I was Tina Brown. In the New Yorker? No, in the New York Observer. Why that's, did you attack that's, that's going against, uh, that's going against uh, Goliath with only David-like weapons. So but, you're, uh, you're out of there? I guess so. Uh, and uh, you're still with the National Review yes. since 1977 yes. and a graduate of Yale. Yes. And are you still supporting and, uh, marijuana? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm focusing on medical marijuana. I mean, I, I have opinions on all the drug laws, but uh, since I had cancer years ago and uh, a chemotherapy. And um, marijuana is very effective against the nausea. And I think it's insane that people are unable to get it for medical purposes. What kind did you have? Uh, marijuana or no, cancer? cancer. <laughs> Testicular cancer. And are you clear? Yes. Uh, and we saw you during that period. You just, you went ahead on, on television and you wore the band, you know, the, let your hair, did you lose your hair? 
Uh, Quentin Crisp said an existentialist is someone who shaves his head when he